Hello everyone, welcome to another video from Bun Med where we discuss concise medical knowledge you can fit inside of a bun. Today we will be going through the explanation for the case um, from the previous video and also looking at the pathophysiology of hemolytic disease and trying to link the two together. Okay, so before we explore what he autoimmune hemolytic disease is, let's think about the symptoms that our patient presented and why he might have presented with them. So here we have our trusty red blood cell and unfortunately for some reason it's gone through hemolysis and this can be any of the reasons that we discussed when looking at our classification method. Now what will happen? Well, when the red blood cell undergoes hemolysis it will release a number of substances alongside it and the red blood cell contains things like hemoglobin which of course is a very important protein for the transfer and, and transport of oxygen and it will contain other things as well like LDH and potassium. Now if you remember um, the investigation showed that the patient had a raised LDH and so I've highlighted the key concepts of this slide in the red box uh, for future reference as well. So the first thing we can think about is with increased hemolysis and increased destruction of the red blood cells there will be an increase in the um, LDH released in the blood and therefore this can be detected um, on laboratory, laboratory assessment. Okay now let's think about the hemoglobin and as you probably know hemoglobin is actually made up of a couple of things. So it has an iron molecule which holds everything together and then the other component is heme. Now, if we think about hemoglobin itself, the body doesn't like free hemoglobin, and it's actually toxic to the kidneys if it starts to build up. And therefore, some of that will be compensated by a protein called haptoglobin. And haptoglobin binds to free hemoglobin in order to prevent it from re reaching toxic levels. Now, unfortunately, what can happen is that if there's too much hemolysis, then the haptoglobin is not in high enough levels and therefore the hemoglobin will be released into the blood anyways. And so what we have is that the haptoglobin levels will be low because they will all be uh, joined to a, a hemoglobin molecule and therefore free haptoglobin levels are low. So that's the second point. We will have low haptoglobin levels in a patient who has hemolysis. Okay, now let's look at the iron component of the hemoglobin. What will happen to that? Well, normally what will happen is that we will have transferrin, which binds to oxygen in the blood, and the transferrin will take it to the bones where the, it can then be used to produce more red blood cells. However, in this circumstance, what happens is that because there is so much iron, again, the transferrin isn't able to keep up, and we have a lot of uh, free iron available in the blood, and this may deposit in various areas of the body as well, for example. And this excess iron will result in a condition known as hemochromatosis. And because this iron is being released due to a secondary cause, which is the uh, hemolysis in this case, this is known as secondary hemochromatosis. And this results in symptoms such as hair loss and joint pain. But other things include uh, fatigue and the patient feeling tired as well. So that's our third point. Now let's look at the heme component of the hemoglobin. So what happens normally is that heme is broken down and processed or metabolized in the body to bilirubin. And again, if we have too much hemolysis, we will have a lot of bilirubin being released. And this bilirubin can deposit in various areas of the body, such as the eyes causing scleral icterus and the skin causing jaundice. And additionally, the bilirubin can form clusters and form stones in, in the gallbladder, i.e. forming gallstones. And this may cause abdominal pain, specifically in the upper right, uh, upper right uh, quadrant. So that's our fourth point. Now let's look at how the bilirubin might also be processed further. And initially when the bilirubin is released, um, in the blood, it's in its conjugated, in its unconjugated form, sorry. And what happens is that it becomes conjugated in the liver and normally it would be released into uh, the urine. 
Now again, because we have a lot of bilirubin, we're going to have a lot of conjugated bilirubin. And conjugated bilirubin, unlike unconjugated bilirubin, is water-soluble. And therefore it will turn the urine darker. And that's our fifth point. Okay, and then we have this idea of intravascular versus extravascular disease. And the key concepts we've explored so far all refer to intravascular hemolysis. However, there are certain diseases which have a more extravascular uh, component to them. And here we have the macrophages and the spleen again. And if the spleen is working over time to try and destroy those red blood cells, um, it can cause splenomegaly, which is enlarging of the spleen. Finally, because there is a reduction in the number of red blood cells because they're being destroyed, the body will try to compensate by increasing the production of reticulocytes. And if you remember back to our patient, he had a high reticulocyte count. And this is the reason the body is trying to compensate. So you can see that the red boxes help to illustrate a summary of um, what might be happening in this patient and why. So we've tried to refer back to the patient's symptoms and explore them in more detail by linking them to the pathophysiology. Okay, so going back to the case now, we can see that many of the things we just discussed manifested in this case as this patient's symptoms. So you can see that he had signs of anemia with the feeling tired and short of breath. He had signs of jaundice because of the uh, excess bilirubin as well as the darker urine. And then he had um, evidence of uh, extravascular hemolysis in the case of splenomegaly. We, we can also see from his abnormal blood results that his hemoglobin was low, reticulocyte count was high, LDH was high as well as the bilirubin. And these are all things we would expect to see in this case. Coupled with the fact that his ha he had low haptoglobin and his Coombs test was positive, suggesting that there were autoantibodies against his red blood cells, this all points towards a diagnosis of um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Finally, we have something called donath lansdena antibodies. And these are specific to cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So, in general, autoimmune hemolytic anemia can be split up into warm or cold. And in this circumstance, our patient had warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And the reason is because in cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia, the patient will typically present with symptoms in the cold. And additionally, they may present with something known as Raynaud's phenomenon. And this is where there is a change in the color of the fingers from white when the patient is uh, in the cold to blue to red and this is illustrating um, the fact that the, the vessels are going through um, spasm and it's affecting the blood flow to the fingers and eventually this will return back to normal and so if it's negative it suggests that the um, disease is not related to cold hemoglobin uh, cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia so it's a good differential to rule out and finally, moving on to the patient's blood film, we can see what's described as polychromasia with spherocytosis. And this essentially refers to the red blood cells not only being different sizes, but also different colours. And you can also see that they develop this spherical sort of shape, and hence the name. Okay, so let's think about the treatment uh, options that we have for this patient. And the first one would be to educate the patient and manage the underlying cause. So let's say this patient did have cold hemolytic anemia. We would be thinking about ways to explain that to the patient and tell them to make sure that they um, stay warm and that they wear gloves, etc. when going out in the cold. Then we can also think about medical therapy. So we can give the patients corticosteroids such as prednisolone, which will help to dampen down that immune system and therefore result in less hemolysis, hopefully. We can also consider giving the patient supportive blood transfusions, because remember that they may be anemic, and therefore by giving the blood transfusions we can manage their symptoms of tiredness, um, breathlessness, tinnitus, arrhythmias, all of the other uh, various symptoms a patient might have if they have anemia. 
We can also do something called plasmapheresis. Now, as you remember, autoimmune hemolytic anemia is a condition where there are antibodies targeted against the red blood cells. And so we can use machines to try and remove those, red, uh, those antibodies against the red blood cells. And hopefully that would mean that the patient has less hemolysis. We can also step up treatment to things like rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, um, monoclonal antibody, and it can be given to patients, and again, this will help to stop those antibodies from working and destroying the red blood cells. Finally, if there is an extravascular component to hemolysis, we can consider a splenectomy, and this will result in the patient not developing symptoms of splenomegaly, which may cause uh, problems later on. So that's everything for today. Um, thank you for watching the video and feel free to leave any questions or comments below. Otherwise, it would massively help us if you could like and subscribe to the channel. See you next time.